Hello everyone. Welcome to this RSAT training on drought monitoring, prediction and projection using NASA Earth System data. My name is Amita Mehta and along with my colleague Sean McCartney, I welcome you to this first session on overview of drought monitoring data and tools using Earth observations. We have a number of expert speakers today from NASA and NOAA and we have a um, joint session between NASA and NOAA uh, helped by Dr. Margaret Horwitz. We'll be introducing our speakers soon but we'll start with a brief introduction to RSET for those of you who are new to RSET. RSET is a NASA Applied Sciences Capacity Building Program and it provides accessible, relevant and cost-free training on remote sensing satellites, sensors, methods and tools. RSET trainings are provided in these thematic areas. They include a variety of applications of satellite data and are tailored to audiences with a variety of experience levels. RSET conducts online trainings most of the time and there are also in-person trainings. They are live and instructor-led or asynchronous and self-paced. All RSET trainings are cost-free. Many of them are conducted in Spanish also, and most of the training material is translated in Spanish. There are some multilingual options as well. We only use open source software and data, and RSET website has a lot of information including all the training material from past and current trainings are available. We'll start with a brief overview of this training. Drought is a period of water shortages and as reported by this United Nations document, drought frequency and duration have been increasing globally since 2000. Drought has killed 650,000 people approximately between 1970 and 2019 and approximately 2.3 billion people around the world are currently facing water stress. It is projected that by 2050, drought could affect more than 75% of the world's population. Drought is a complex phenomenon and as shown here in this schematic, it occurs on a variety of timescales from weekly, monthly, seasonal and annual to multi-year. Since drought affects drinking water availability, crop production and ecosystems for better water, agricultural and social economic management and planning, it's crucial to monitor and forecast drought conditions. And that is the motivation for this current training. Overall learning objectives for this training are that by the end of this training, you will be able to identify important earth observations and tools for assessing short term, that is weekly to monthly to long term, seasonal to multi-decadal drought conditions. Identify drought portals and relevant geophysical parameters for monitoring droughts globally and regionally. Access and analyze sub-seasonal to seasonal forecasts of temperature and precipitation for evolving drought conditions for a region of interest. Access and analyze climate change projection data to assess impacts on long-term drought conditions for a region of interest. Finally, explore selected regional drought monitoring tools that can be customized for a user region of interest. Prerequisites for this training are fundamentals of remote sensing and more importantly, remote sensing of drought. Uh, this is RSET's earlier drought training, which introduced earth observations and a number of drought indices in that training. There will be four sessions to this training. In today's session will focus on drought monitoring um, data and tools using earth observations. And the next two sessions will focus on uh, prediction and projection of evolving drought conditions, one on seasonal to subseasonal time scale, and second one on climate projection, so multi decadal time scale. And then the last session will have demonstration of regional drought monitoring tools, which can be customized for the region of your in for any region of your interest. There is homework uh, that's posted today on our website, and that's due by August 15th. 
um, a certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live sessions and complete the homework assignment before the given due date. Um, just uh, to note here that today's session is going to be a little longer than the rest of the three sessions. Uh, there will be a lot of information uh, available about a number of drought tools and there will be also a demonstration of how to calculate drought indices. So let's start with overview of drought monitoring data and tools using earth observations. We'll start with introduction of our invited speakers. We'll start with Dr. Compton Tucker. He is a senior scientist at NASA Goddard Space Threat Center. He was among the first researchers to employ satellite data for studying photosynthesis on land, determining land cover, monitoring droughts, and providing famine early warnings. More recently, he and his colleagues have mastered mapping billions of trees and converting these into carbon at tree level using machine learning coupled to high performance computing. And today he will be talking about drought mapping for food security. Next, we introduce our NOAA colleagues for today's session. First, we want to thank Dr. Margaret Horowitz. Uh, she helped coordinate this joint NASA NOAA session. Uh, Margaret serves as the hydroclimatic services lead for the National Weather Service. Bridging between the Climate Services Program and Water Resources Service Program, she develops program milestones, formulates policy, and makes recommendations for new research and products, especially those related to drought and precipitation. Our speakers include Kelsey Sattalino, Steve Ansari, and Brad Pugh. Uh, Kelsey Sattalino and Steve Ansari, they both support uh, National Integrated Drought Information System, or NIDIS. Kelsey supports NIDIS digital communication efforts, including content development, user feedback and engagement, and strategic planning for the U.S. Drought Portal. portal. Uh, Steve Ansari is Drought Portal Manager um, and uh, he has a background in variety of GIS, data management and visualization activities within NOAA, including radar, satellite and severe weather data sets. He is also the primary author of the NOAA Weather and Climate Toolkit software application. Both Kelsey and Steve will be presenting and providing overview of drought.gov. Our final NOAA speaker for today would be Brad Pugh. He is a meteorologist at NOAA's Climate Prediction Center. He is involved in forecasting um, temperature and precipitation outlooks, uh, also a U.S. hazards outlook, monthly and seasonal outlooks, seasonal drought outlooks, and he is author of North America Drought Monitor and U.S. Drought Monitor. He will be providing details of U.S. Drought Monitor today. So the specific objectives for part one are that by the end of this session, you will be able to identify earth observation data sets and tools for both global and regional drought monitoring, explore regional drought monitoring tools for analyzing drought conditions in the U.S., an overview of drought mapping for food security using global inventory modeling and mapping studies, global agricultural monitoring or GLEM. And then finally, Sean McCartney will demonstrate how to calculate drought indices for a selected time and region of interest using Google Earth Engine. As we go through the session, please feel free to put your questions in the question box and we will address them at the end of the webinar. We'll try to get to all the questions during the question and answer session after the webinar. And the remainder of the questions uh, will be answered in the question and answer document, which will be posted on the training website about a week after the training. So we'll start with an overview of our observations and tools. As we talked earlier, there are several types of droughts occurring on multiple time scales, starting with meteorological drought, um, which is primarily indicated by precipitation deficiency and related weather parameters as listed here. 
Next is agricultural drought that is uh, indicated by soil water, water deficiency, uh, plant water stress and reduced biomass and yield and that is characterized by uh, decrease in normalized difference vegetation index as we will see later. Finally hydrological drought that indicates uh, again depletion in soil moisture and groundwater. It reduces stream flow um, and lake level heights um, and also reduces wetlands and wildlife habitat. All these droughts occurring on different time scales eventually affect economic and social sectors and has ecological impacts as well. So all, all the indicators we, we just talked about, they're available from remote sensing. Uh, we've talked about this um, in our previous training. So we're just going to provide a brief table here that we have a number of satellites. Um, there's a global precipitation measurement mission uh, that provides precipitation data and the sensors and spatial and temporal resolutions and coverage are provided in these two columns. Soil moisture is available from soil moisture active passive satellite uh, with a microwave radiometer. Uh, groundwater is available from currently GRACE follow-on. It has a K-band microwave radar altimeter. Uh, land surface temperature, uh, NDVI, evapotranspiration, all indicator of droughts. They are available from multiple satellites with optical and thermal sensors uh, that include Landsat, Terra, Aqua, um, SUMI National Polar Partnership and Joint Polar Satellite Systems. So you can learn more about this from our previous uh, training. Then there are drought indices. There are commonly used operational drought indices, which are Standardized Precipitation Index or SPI, Palmer Drought Severity Index or PDSI, and Normalized Difference Vegetation Index or NDVI. So any anomalies of these uh, indices are examined to assess drought conditions. So drought indices are basically mathematical representation of water deficit or excess uh, compared to historical data. They help decide when to start implementing water conservation or drought response measures and can be used to analyze drought frequency, severity and duration for a given location and period. Again, our training, earlier training provides more details. Standardized Precipitation Index or SPI um, that's primarily defined to characterize meteorological drought. So mathematically, historical rainfall data at any location fitted with gamma distribution represent cumulative probability function. And if a rainfall event is a low probability on the cumulative probability function, it is indicative of a drought event. So the SPI values can be interpreted as the number of standard deviation by which the observed rainfall anomaly deviates from the long-term mean. SPI averaged over different time periods uh, ranging from 3 to 12 months uh, indicate severity and duration of drought. Next is Palmer Drought Severity Index, PDSI. This is an index for evaluating the severity and frequency of prolonged periods of abnormally dry or wet conditions. PDSI uses both temperature and precipitation data and a physical water balance model to estimate relative dryness. PDSI formula is given here uh, where M is for each month where Z is moisture anomaly index based on the water balance model. Finally, NDVI that is based on reflected red and infrared lights and relationship between them. Uh, chlorophyll strongly absorbs um, red light and plant structure strongly reflects near infrared light. So uh, these wavelengths uh, reflected back to satellite sensor, they're measured and NDVI is calculated based on this formula shown here. So what it shows is that uh, when NDVI is close to 1, uh, that um, shows presence of high density of green leaves. And when it is negative or close to 0, that means no green leaves are present. 
NTVI anomalies uh, can be used to monitor drought conditions as we will see later. So the indices we saw, SPI, PTSI, and NDVI, they are used in some of the existing uh, drought monitoring tools as we will see in, in a presentation later today. So here is a list or a table of drought monitoring and early warning tools already existing. Uh, these are global and regional drought monitoring tools. Some are uh, focused on specific regions such as North America or US, um, some for Africa, different parts of Africa and Asia. And there are global drought monitoring tools um, as listed here. Some uh, focus on vegetation indices, some look at other parameters such as precipitation and soil moisture. So if you go to this EOTech DevNet drought data and tool matrix, you will see all these tools listed there, uh, methodology of how the tools are put together and what data sets are used are also provided. They're available from there. Uh, since we do not have time to go through these tools in detail, what we are doing is we have we picked a few tools so North American uh, US Drought Monitor and uh, drought.gov. Uh, these will be presented next by our NOAA colleagues. There will be some information about uh, global drought information as well. And we will also see uh, global agricultural mapping or GLAM um, uh, at the end. So these are the tools that we will focus on today. So next presentation will be from Kelsey Satolino and uh, Steve Ansari. Uh, they will talk about uh, drought.gov and then Brad Pugh will talk about um, a US drought monitor and we'll have um, Compton Tucker talk about uh, GLEM and uh, drought mapping for uh, food security. And then finally, we will have a demonstration of uh, calculating SPI and NDVI using GEE by Sean McCartney. So I'm going to hand it over to Kelsey and Steve. So Kelsey, uh, take it away, please. Thank you. Thank you, Amita. I'm Kelsey Satellino with the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences, or CERES, uh, and I am the Digital Communications Coordinator for NOAA's National Integrated Drought Information System, or NIDIS. Thank you, Amita. Um, my name is Steve Ansari. I am with the National Centers for Environmental Information, uh, and I am the uh, U.S. Drought Portal Manager for Drought.gov with the uh, NIDIS program as well. So um, I want to start today's presentation by giving you a little bit of background on what the National Integrated Drought Information System is and what the U.S. Drought Portal is before giving a deep dive into some tools and resources for drought monitoring and prediction on the U.S. Drought Portal. NOAA's National Integrated Drought Information System, or NIDIS, is a multi-agency U.S. government program, and our mandate is to develop and provide a national drought early warning system for the United States. Uh, we do this, as you can see on the screen, through eight regional drought early warning systems, or DUES regions. Um, and DUES regions are networks of federal, tribal, state, academic, and other partners that work to make climate and drought science accessible and useful for decision makers. The goal of these regionally focused networks is, is to improve stakeholders' capacity to monitor, forecast, and plan for the impacts of drought. NIDIS's mission is to enable the nation to move from a reactive to a more proactive approach to managing drought risks and impacts. And we do this by coordinating drought monitoring, forecasting, planning, and other information um, across the United States. NIDIS established the U.S. Drought Portal website, or www.drought.gov, in 2008. The U.S. Drought Portal is the United States government's authoritative interagency drought information website. Um, it is a one-stop shop to integrate data, maps, graphs, drought research information, educational resources, and other decision support resources from across the government and other agencies all in one place. The U.S. Drought Portal is managed by a development team at NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information, or NCEI, and is led by the U.S. Drought Portal Manager, Steve Ansari, who is my co-presenter today. 
Now, drought.gov does focus primarily on U.S. data, as the name U.S. Drought Portal implies, but it also includes global data and resources as well. Some of the hallmarks of drought.gov are the interactive and customizable maps and tools throughout the website. We have high resolution, low latency, interactive maps and data that allow users to visualize this information in new ways and download data files and high quality customized images. We pull in publicly available data from across government agencies, um, academic institutions and other organizations all in one place for drought monitoring and prediction. On drought.gov, you can explore drought data and information in a variety of ways. If you look at our menu at the top of this screenshot, and I'll show you the website itself in just a moment, you can explore drought data by topic in our data and map section, by economic sector, showing uh, droughts cascading impacts across different sectors of the economy in our by sector section, or by geographic scale in our by location section. We also have information in our research and learn section on educational resources about drought, as well as information on innovative drought research and research into action. And our news and events tab includes uh, news stories, upcoming workshops and webinars, email lists, and regional drought status updates for our drought early warning systems across the nation. Um, this screenshot is showing our data catalog, which I'm going to dive into and show you in just a moment. This features background information, documentation, links, and data downloads for national and global drought and climate data sets. So the first uh, feature of drought.gov that I want to show you today that can be used for drought monitoring and prediction is our data catalog. You can find this by going to the data and map section of our website and clicking all data. It's a curated collection of drought data sets, maps, and tools where you can search for a specific tool, filter by topic, by geographic coverage, file format, or data type, for example, in situ or radar or satellite data. Uh, you can also then click for more information on every uh, data catalog page, which includes an overview of the data set in plain language, documentation, links to the original source, and where available data download links. And now I'm going to switch over to drought.gov to show you a little bit of our data catalog. To access our data catalog, just go to the data and maps section of drought.gov in the top menu of the website. And under find data, you'll see an option for all data at the bottom. This will take you to our interactive data catalog where you can see uh, a brief description and some quick information about a variety of drought and climate data sets and tools. You can filter this data by geographic extent. So for example, you could select global to view global data sets, and that will filter for all available data sets. This catalog includes more than just the maps that are directly available on drought.gov. So it's a great resource for finding reliable, trusted drought and climate information. You can also filter data by topic, such as snow drought, uh, paleoclimate data, precipitation data, ecological drought data, soil moisture data, or filter by file format, data type, such as land-based stations, model data, radar, radar or satellite data, uh, or directly search for a specific tool in our search bar. If you're looking to download data, you can click this link here to download data, which will take you to our drought.gov data download page, which is at drought.gov slash data hyphen download, or you can find it through our data catalog page link, which I just showed you. This is where you can find uh, GIS and web ready data downloads for all the data sets that we are ingesting and displaying on drought.gov, either as a GeoTIFF, as a JSON file, or as map tiles. Going back to our data catalog, if you click on any of these individual links, you'll be taken to a data catalog page, which includes some quick links to the website tool or data downloads, uh, metadata such as the geographic area of coverage, the type of data, the period of record, and file, uh, file types available for download, how to information, access links, documentation, and more. 
One of the other hallmarks of drought.gov are the interactive and customizable maps across the website. Drought.gov pulls in publicly available data from across US government agencies, academic institutions, as well as global data sets and displays them in interactive automatically updating maps. If you click the download and view map image icon on the top left corner of any map on the website, it will open up a map customization pop-up like the one you see on my slide. This allows you to view that map uh, in a larger context to zoom in or out, pan to a region of interest. You also have a number of data customization options for the map. You can use the current data layer drop down at the top to select from any of the other map layers that are on that same web page, adjust the transparency of that layer. You can change the base map using the background layer drop down. For United States data sets, you can overlay the current US drought monitor and adjust the transparency of that layer as well. And also for US data sets, you can choose to display Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico in, as cutouts at the bottom of the map alongside the contiguous US, or to display uh, geographic border outlines for US states, counties, and tribal nations. Finally, you can click Save Map in the bottom left-hand corner of this pop-up to save a high-quality PNG image of your customized map, which is a great resource for communicating in presentations, in reports, on social media, and just for analyzing data by being able to jump between different data sets while zoomed in on a particular region of interest. The next tool on drought.gov that I want to feature for you all is our historical data and conditions tool. Uh, I'm going to show you this in a live demo in just a moment, but this tool was created because we kept getting the question, how does this drought compare to past droughts for my specific region? This is an interactive time series graph and map that allow you to view and download three historical drought data sets side by side. The first is the U.S. Drought Monitor, which is issued weekly and uh, from the year 2000 until the present. A nine-month standardized precipitation index from the National Centers for Environmental Information's and Climb Grid Monthly data set. This is issued monthly from 1985 to the present. And an estimated Palmer Modified Drought Index, which is based on paleoclimate data using tree ring reconstructions and instrumental data to estimate June to August drought conditions from the year zero to the year 2017 for many regions of the United States. There are a number of features on this historical conditions tool, which I'll show you. At the top, you can jump between each of these three data sets by selecting the tab for the data set of interest. You can click on the map directly to select a state or a county to load state or county historical data. Um, you can click shift plus clicking on different states to select a custom region of multiple states or multiple counties, and that will update the time series graph, statistics, and map for your customized region. You can also click on the time series directly to jump to a different date uh, and to hover over dates to see a quick glance of statistics of different drought categories for that specific historical date. Below that, we have a number of different options, some of which are, are similar to what you can do by directly interacting with the map and graph. Our time series options section allows you to zoom in on a particular time period of interest by putting in the years and clicking update graph. You can combine multiple states and counties uh, in the combined states and combined counties sections, as well as by clicking on the map to create a custom region of interest. So for example, if you wanted to look at the Pacific Northwest US, you could combine the states of Washington, Idaho, Oregon, and Montana, and view a custom map and historical time series just for that region. You can also hover over the legend, which is on the right-hand side underneath the map and time series to view more information about that data set, the percent area of the region that you've selected that is in each category. And the about this data set section gives you a brief plain language description of the map, as well as some additional information about where to learn more information about this data set. Finally, at the bottom, we have a variety of download options. You can download an image of just the map, just the time series, 
or the map and time series for the specific time range, data set, and location that you've selected. You can embed this entire tool into your own website, or you can download a CSV, XML, or JSON file. We also have a README file and a data catalog page that gives you guidance on how to interpret the historical information that's available. So now I'm going to give you a brief tour of the actual tool itself so you can see how this works in practice. To get to the historical data and conditions tool, again, go to the data and map section of drought.gov and the find data section, and you'll see it's the third link down, historical information. So by default, we're showing uh, the US drought monitor, but you can also view a nine month standardized precipitation index or paleoclimate data showing a Palmer modified drought index. For each of these data sets, uh, you can select a state to load that state's historical data. And now I'm seeing a time series and statistics specific to North Carolina. I can shift plus click to select multiple states or click reset selections to revert back to the entire United States. Once I've selected a region of interest, I can also uh, pan over this time series graph to at a glance see some statistics for the different US drought monitor categories for this custom uh, region that I've selected. Or I can click somewhere along the graph to update the map and these statistics in the legend to that date, for, in this example, December 14th, 2010. All of these statistics show the per total percent land area that's covered by that drought category. I can choose to zoom in if I want to get a closer view at the time series graph to say 2010 to 2012. And that will allow me to see in more detail the drought conditions for that time period. You can also uh, adjust some other settings like showing or hiding this blue date label, whether you want to be able to show data on hover or not. Or you can also isolate a particular drought category to view it more closely. So for example, I could show only D4 or exceptional drought areas, or only drought um, excluding D0 or abnormally dry conditions. Um, the combined states and counties section have automatically updated based on my selections on the map. If I wanted to remove a state, I could just click the X button or use the drop down to add an additional state. And you can actually jump down to the county level for any of these historical data sets as well. Uh, the map legend is interactive, allowing you to see a definition of each of the different categories, as well as the statistics for your area you've selected, and an about section. Um, if you click all downloads, you'll see all of the download options available, and it's customized for the specific custom region that you have selected. Um, so you can download a CSV, XML, or JSON file, or an image. And if you download an image, you're given the option to download the map and time series, time series, or just a map. If you want to find more information about this data, click the Learn More link in the About This Data Set section. We also have source information for the original data listed in the bottom left corner of the tool. The next feature of drought.gov that I want to highlight for you is the ability to view drought data by geographic location. And this is one of the, the biggest features and hallmarks of drought.gov. By going to the by location section of the drought.gov website, you can view data, maps, tools, and resources personalized for your geographic scale, either by entering your city or zip code into the select a location uh, search bar in the by location section or directly on our homepage. Uh, you can view drought information by county, by US state or territory, by each of our regional drought early warning systems, which are, are listed here. Uh, by Huck 2 watershed in the United States, for US tribal nations, for the entire nation, or uh, internationally with global data, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Our international resources page is part of our biolocation section. And the goal of this page was to provide a curated list of resources for international drought maps, uh, monitoring and predicting information, as well as humanitarian alert systems. This page includes several interactive global drought and climate indicators, including several global standardized precipitation index maps, 
as well as the Vegetation Health Index, uh, as well as a curated list of resources uh, for monitoring drought across the globe. I'm going to take you to the international page now to show you exactly what you can do on this page um, and to highlight some of the interactive map capabilities that we have on the site. So you can access the international page by going to by location from the main menu and then selecting international. It's also at drought.gov slash international if you want to type that into your search bar. At the top of this page, as you can see on many pages throughout drought.gov, are several interactive maps that we've pulled in from other sources. Um, in this case, it is a three-month standardized precipitation index using the ERA-5 data set. You can pan around the map to a region of interest or zoom in or out. You can also view a plain language description of the data set. Uh, legend information, which provides specific information when you hover to show what SPI value corresponds to each of these percentile categories. Update information about how frequently the data is updated and a learn more link to view more information about the data. In addition, um, you could see a nine month standardized precipitation index from the Global Precipitation Climatology Center and the Vegetation Health Index from NOAA. If you click on this download icon that I mentioned earlier, you can customize and download any of these maps on this page or otherwise. Uh, this customization pop-up, as I mentioned before, allows you to pan and zoom to a region of interest, adjust the layer transparency, change the background layer of the base map, and adjust several other categories before saving the map as a high quality PNG image. Our international page also contains some summary of different impacts of drought around the globe. Featured international drought maps, including the Global Drought Monitor, which I'll talk about in just a moment, and the North American Drought Monitor, which is a cooperative effort between the United States, Canada, and Mexico to monitor drought across um, the North American continent. Tools to visualize and analyze drought worldwide. Um, Steve is going to talk about Climate Engine in just a moment, but there's another number of other useful tools and resources uh, for analyzing drought globally. Worldwide humanitarian alert systems, such as the Famine Early Warning Systems Network and the Global Disaster Alert and Coordination System and others. And then a more comprehensive list of international drought resources, including global drought mapping tools, and regional drought monitoring systems organized by region. So this is a really useful resource as a jumping off point to find more drought monitoring prediction and planning information, even though drought.gov is primarily focused on the US government. So next, I just wanna highlight before I hand it over to Steve, one specific international resource that we highlight on our international page on drought.gov that is not a drought.gov map, but is supported by NIDIS and by the drought.gov team um, and other parts of NOAA. And that's the Global Drought Information System. The Global Drought Information System or GDIS is an international effort to bring together the best non-prescriptive drought information from local to national providers. The goal is to provide an apples to apples comparison of drought conditions around the world. And uh, they do this through a global drought monitor, which depicts current drought conditions across the globe, uh, as well as prediction resources, uh, research and education resources, and other drought management tools. So you can find a link to the Global Drought Monitor on the drought.gov international page under Featured International Drought Maps, or you can go to gdis-noaa.hub.arcgis.com. Um, so as you can see here, uh, the Global Drought Information System consists of the Global Drought Monitor, which you can get to by clicking Monitoring Drought, either here or below. Uh, forecasting drought information, management tools, and research and education resources. So if I click on monitoring, I'll see the global drought monitor. Um, and this is an interactive map using the ArcGIS online platform, um, which uses a bottom-up approach to depict current drought conditions across the globe. Uh, this means that the drought conditions are not assessed by one central organization, but they're assessed by the nations of that continent. And then the NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information takes those continental 
um, drought monitoring indices and puts them all into one ArcGIS online map that you can use to view global drought information. So you can view a smaller version on this page or click go to the global drought monitor to view a full screen version of this interactive map. I won't go through every data set that's available here for the sake of time, but on the left hand side, you'll see um, a variety of different options of layers that you can choose from. Um, there's a number of agricultural layers showing different crops um, from the map spam or spatial production allocation model that you can choose to layer, um, administrative boundaries, including world countries, as well as America and Indian, Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian areas uh, for the US, uh, a variety of continental drought monitors, including the European Combined Drought Indicator and the North American Drought Monitor, which as you can see here, you can display alongside other layers on the map. For each of these, you can click these three dots to increase or decrease the transparency of a given layer or view details to learn more information about that specific data set. Uh, we also have a number of blended drought indicators um, as well as evaporation based indices. We have several different evaporative demand drought index data sets based on different underlying data, uh, which shows the evaporative demand uh, or the thirst of the atmosphere which can be uh, one key in, in index in monitoring drought. A standardized precipitation index or SPI from several different uh, global data sets, as well as the standardized precipitation evapotranspiration index, groundwater and soil moisture information from NASA's GRACE, um, vegetation health index, and some demographic population data. Um, so with any of these, you can choose to hide or display a layer by clicking the checkbox next to that layer. And that will hide or display a particular data set. On the right hand side, you can view more information about the map and about how to use the tools. And if you scroll down to the legend information, you'll see a list of all of the different data sets that are available here. If you click on that data set, you'll see a link for more information, a brief plain language description of the data set, a legend and a valid date. If you'd like to share this map, you can do that using the link at the top. You can also explore the other resources available through the Global Drought Information System, which includes uh, global drought forecasting information. You can click on this interactive map to view drought forecasting resources uh, from different organizations across the, the globe. Just click on it and then you'll be able to see um, a forecasting resource for that region. Uh, drought management tools and research and education resources for scientists and students. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Steve Ansari, the US Drought Portal Manager, to talk a little bit about one other international drought tool, Climate Engine. All right, thank you, Kelsey. Um, I'm going to now talk about a tool called Climate Engine, which is a very powerful tool that has been developed at the Western Regional Climate Center and Desert Research Institute, um, funded by NIDIS and others um, that we are now using operationally to make drought indices and um, allow additional insights into the information um, in a cloud-based platform. So Climate Engine, uh, really empowers users of all technical proficiencies to harness the power of cloud computing to look at massive time scales and stacks of information of earth observation data it's built on top of the google earth engine platform and benefits by having access to a lake of data in the earth engine uh, data catalog which is maintained by google and other federal partners that include data sets far beyond NOAA's data sets. And the idea is that you put an algorithm and write it into the cloud, and then you can operate that algorithm on any of the data sets that are there very efficiently, minimizing the amount of management of files and um, moving, moving data around, downloading data, um, and, and all of the pain that comes from just that data management side of things. So, 
the way that draft.gov is utilizing climate engine is um, there's an API side of the tool where I'm going to give a demo of the tool, which is um, open for, for folks to uh, use and, and explore data sets. There's also an API, and that is what we are using in drought.gov to uh, produce high resolution daily gridded data sets um, from a variety of um, data sets from NOAA and beyond to, to create drought indices and other products. Um, the, at a scale of which we could never do before with our on-premises equipment um, and would take a lot of engineering to do the same with custom cloud-based development. So again, this tool is developed by the Western Regional Climate Center and the Desert Research Institute, and it's been around for 10 years. Uh, launched for researchers in 2014. There's a commercial launch in 2020. Um, there is a group that has done an offshoot of this to provide commercial support um, based on some of the, the original work in this. And the, um, the climate engine, there's an application and a user interface, and then again, also an API for doing various types of statistics and insights into data sets, uh, including for us some important metrics that allow us to create common drought indices at various timescales at daily resolutions across multiple data sets to look at how um, drought is progressing in the US and across the world. So with that, I'm going to stop and go into a demo. So looking at the website here, climateengine.org, the, at the top, there are links to the API, to different um, reports that are generated from this tool support um, site as well, which I will go through and highlight that. But I'm going to start by just looking at the app. And here we get an idea of what this tool can do. So there are guided tours, video tours. There's a lot of um, information about and tutorials on how to use this site and i'm just going to touch on a few of the features here particularly some of the ones that we're using with drought but this tool is not a drought specific tool and can be used for lots of different analyses very powerful um, types of applications including um, looking at uh, long-term an anomalies trends we can look at sea surface temperature we can look at vegetation and ndvi changes across satellites um, there's a wealth of different data sets here that we'll see they have a a, a a tool or a spreadsheet where you can go in and get more information about all of the data set sort of acronyms and codes here uh, but there is a wealth of different data sets including some that are very difficult to deal with outside of the cloud like the sentinel data um, that's that's a unique thing that is very difficult to work with um, for large scale analysis. So I'm going to go in here and just give a quick example using um, a data set called called GridMet. Here, if we want to do a precipitation accumulation, here we select our data set, our variable. There are a number of different um, uh, metrics, uh, variables, and metrics available to us. And if we want to just do a quick um, accumulation of the last 90 days of data, we can do that very easily here. So let's say that we wanted to also compare this 90 day period to see, well, how unusual is this? Um, here, I'm going to turn on some, some layers for or U.S. states, if we wanted to see, well, how does this compare to the same 90-day period across the last 30 years, we could, um, we could do that here by looking at this calculation. And, I mean, first off, we could calculate the average conditions um, for the same period over the last 30 years um, or any custom time period. But we can also do a, a percent of average conditions, which is a a common metric that we use to look at where things are abnormal. 
And so you can customize your year range here that you want to use to compare it to. I'm going to use a standard um, range of 91 to 2020, which matches the current normals period from NOAA uh, that are used for our climate normals that you hear um, you know, the on the news for the average temperature, that sort of thing. So here's an example uh, showing how the last 90 days have, we've compared it now to the previous uh, 30 years of information and send the computations on the cloud uh, very quickly to do that analysis. Now, the power here is that we have, we can do the same thing, not just to one data set, but let's say we wanted to do the same thing with um, uh, global data sets. So we can look at here, um, era five, as well. So if we wanted to get the precipitation totals for the last 90 days, we can do that globally. There are tools here to um, adjust our layers that we're showing. So if we want to show um, country borders, we can do that here as well. And then we can do the same analyses here uh, where we are doing a percent of the average conditions for the last 90 days. And this may take a bit longer for this data set. Um, there, there are some data sets where we have some caching in place where it goes very, very quickly. So we'll see um, this, the speed at which this comes back. Um, so while this is working, we can. this is actually a great a data set that takes a little longer because it gets you an idea of what's actually happening. Each one of the tiles that's coming back uh, inside of Google Earth Engine, each one of these tiles is being produced in parallel. And so the, the way that it ends up on our, on our map, the map shows the data by tiles and the tiles can be calculated in parallel on the cloud in the Earth Engine program to to process and return that information at great scale. So it has taken the last 90 days of data and then compared it, accumulated that across 90 days, then dynamically also accumulated the 90 days of data for the last 30 years from 91 to 2020, and then compared all of those to get the average all in real time here. Um, as we have made the request, we can zoom in on the map and it will update the data um, and reprocess at higher resolutions if it's needed to. One of the tricks that Earth Engine can do and, and Climate Engine in turn um, is that for data that is where you're zoomed way out and it's, it can use lower resolution sort of overviews to process things faster. And as you zoom in, it will just for the areas that you're interested in reprocess stuff um, at the higher resolution. So um, it looks like it's starting to come in here at this higher resolution. And this is a pretty hefty calculation um, this, because we're comparing to a 30 year period dynamically. Um, this is something that would usually take hours of effort to customize code and then run you know, on, on premises, especially if you account having to download all the files you need and manage, manage those files and get everything kind of uh, organized. So um, once you have this, you can uh, download an area if you want just a, a region. Here we can say that we just want to download um, you know, some, some area that we're interested in. And we can download that um, information. Well, we can save a PDF, but we can also save it as a map image as a PDF. We can also save this as a GeoTIFF right here. So right now it's going in and if I click here, it will give me a GeoTIFF to, um, to download. That's a re result of what I'm looking at on the map. So, um, if you've used Earth Engine before, Earth Engine, here's my GeoTIFF download and includes some, I think, metadata with the zip file. 
If we've used Earth Engine before, Google's product, um, it requires, it's very, very flexible and very powerful, but it doesn't include a user interface like this. So what Climate Engine has done is created the algorithm templates for various common climate applications and then put this user interface around it so that you can adjust the parameters and not have to write script and custom code. Um, and that way things can be more efficient because they are using optimized algorithms that have all of their knowledge for Earth Engine bundled into that so that um, things can run as fast as possible and, um, and allow you to do easily do apples to apples comparisons across different data sets. So I'll show another example here of if we wanted to take, um, uh, do a, a time series, we can also do that. So we can uh, extract out um, for a point or a, uh, or a region. So if we wanted, it can do zonal statistics or area averages. So if we wanted to just look at a particular country and do that um, average for a whole country or for a U.S. state, uh, we can easily do that here. So if we go U.S. regions and we can go states and we can go, uh, let's say, Alabama, and we want to look at what the uh, precipitation is for the last 90 days from the era five data set. We can do that zonal or not that, yeah, that zonal statistic, that area average right here um, for that. If we wanted to do um, compare to different data sets, we can go in here and we can, let's say we want to compare uh, GridMet to era five. Um, we can easily do that as well. And so we'll say last 90 days for, for GridMet and we'll hit. All right. And so here we can see, see how things um, compare in terms of the, the, for the whole state of Alabama. Uh, we can also do a single point as well. And this becomes very powerful for being able to do comparison across data sets and be able to, to, you know, there's multiple data sets and different methodologies for having gridded temperature and precipitation data and being able to, to see some of those differences are really important. Um, other things that we can do here, if we're making a map, um, there are, uh, specific to drought, some very important drought indices, which we can calculate right here from the, um, dynamically. So let's say that we want to do a global SPEI using the era five data set. It can dynamically generate these drought indices using five data set. You can control metrics like the distribution parameters, which type you want to use. It's going to hit cancel. It'll keep doing that in the background. We can use gamma or log logistic as well. Um, and we can do this across many different data sets. And this is, this is important in that, um, again, being able to see an apples to apples comparison using the same distribution parameters across different input data sets that have different methodologies for interpolating the data in areas where you don't have gauges or maybe they use satellite information, model reanalysis as well. Now we can do the same thing for a different data set. So this is for the um, CPC unified, NOAA CPC unified daily global data set. It's dynamically doing this drought index on the cloud with all this parallel processing by tile which is again, very powerful. We used to run one of these on premises uh, to generate this from a satellite data set that would take eight hours every day to run so that we could update with the next day's information. Um, now that same process to run this takes um, mere minutes to do that. We are using for drought.gov, um, we are using the, the API side of this and 
I'll show that in just a second. The last thing I really want to hit on, this is important in terms of making products, but the real gist of Climate Engine is that it, it helps you find answers and not have to deal with files. I have not selected a file in this operation. I have worked with at the abstract level of data sets and algorithms and metrics and time periods. I have not had to manage files, untar files, discover files, download files from catalogs. That's very important. Um, to, to There are times when that's needed, but, but I, one of the powers of this tool is not having to deal with that and focusing on finding an answer from what you're looking for. Um, that could be, let's say that we want to look at um, all of the areas that had uh, maximum temperature from in the world. Let's look at maximum temperature. So this is the mean maximum temperature over, let's say, last 15 days. You could pick any time period. Um, but let's say that we wanted to uh, look at where the maximum temperature was over a hundred degrees on any of the on any of the days over the last 15 days. So if we wanted to, we can use masking here and just show values above a minimum. So if we're looking at at a hundred degrees, these are all the areas where the maximum daily temperature has been a hundred degrees or greater in the last 15 days. And if we wanted to extend that out to a longer period, it's as simple as, as um, selecting it here. If we wanted to be really wild and do like a whole year, let's see how, how long that takes. Oh, it appears I need to reset my mask. When that changes, show above them in of 100. So these are all of the areas that had at least one day that was over 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the last you know, year plus three weeks, two weeks. I can pause that there. So this is, the, this is really the point is that now we're into looking at insights and getting answers um, to questions that, that we have. Uh, and that's what we're also really focused on in the new features that are coming about in Climate Engine. One last thing I'll show related to drought, let's say we wanted to look at the North American Drought Monitor, which is a monthly drought monitor that combines the Canadian, Mexican, and U.S. drought monitor efforts. And we want to look at, um, here, let's say we want to process all 20, 20 years of it. Actually, let me make sure probably don't. Uh, let me just say entire period of record of that data set. So we're going to take the entire period of record of data set and look at the maximum drought classification value. So right now it's going through 22 years of data. And um, this is the maximum drought category that's ever existed in the last 22 years of the North American Drought Monitor. Um, so if you wanted to ever answer the question of how bad has the drought ever been in, in Maine or in Alaska or in Mexico, in the Yucatan, you can get that answer in mere seconds using, um, using this tool. So on drought.gov, we are using this to generate this tool. We have a, a instance of the API for this tool running within a NOAA security boundary. Um, on a NOAA Google Cloud contract. And we are using this every night to generate these drought indices uh, and these data sets, anomaly data sets in cloud optimized GeoTIFF format that you can just click and download a GeoTIFF uh, for, for these different data sets. And this would be the foundation of future uh, drought indicator availability, production availability on drought.gov and that we can share in our and use in our tools, uh, including like NASA GPM, uh, iMERGE data, the CMORF satellite data set from NOAA, the ERA-5 uh, 
global reanalysis from ECMWF. Uh, and these, a variety of different US global, uh, US gridded precipitation data sets, which all have slightly different methodologies for how they interpolate data between gauges and being able to compare these and have that apples to apples comparison of all always using the same algorithm and same climatology base period to compare it to is very powerful. Um, so with that, um, the last thing I'll hit on, the very last thing I'll hit on is on the climateengine.org site, there is a link to the API documentation. The team is happy to work with folks to generate, um, to give API keys for testing and using this, um, the, the, uh, there is support here under the support link for how to use the API, how to use the research app, which I just showed the, the web application, information about data sets and so on. And uh, this includes a lot of information on the API, including a lot of great examples on how to use Python scripts with the API, how to uh, example Python uh, notebooks that are right in Google CoLab that you can run. And so i uh, really excited about what this team has done in doing this. Um, we are using the Climate Engine tool um, for, for drought.gov. We're also using it for an industry proving ground project at NCEI that will include a lot of different spatial analysis and generating the data sets that look at um, things like um, number of occurrences below and above a, a threshold, uh, comparing to population data, land cover data, agricultural data, uh, and so on, all using Earth Engine. And we're really excited about what this tool can provide us and, and give us rapid, rapid, pro rapid production of the answers that we're looking for and a pathway for us to do this in operations in NOAA. So with that, I will... I will stop, but thank you so much. I think I will hand it back to Kelsey to wrap us up here. Thank you, Steve. Uh, you can see a brief summary slide here, um, but I just wanna say thank you all for letting us share this information with you. Um, we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have later, but in the meantime, I wanna hand it off to Brad Pugh for the next presentation. Thanks, Kelsey and Steve. Um, I'm a Brad Pugh at NOAA's Climate Prediction Center. I'm a, a meteorologist at the Climate Prediction Center and also one of the U.S. Drought Monitor authors. So I'm uh, very excited today to either introduce you to the U.S. Drought Monitor or provide uh, more details on the U.S. Drought Monitor. And before starting the presentation, I would also like to thank uh, Brian Fuchs and Mark Savoda at the National Drought Mitigation Center, as I did use a few of their slides in this presentation today. All right, here's a uh, outline of today's uh, presentation. I'll start off with a history of the US Drought Monitor go over the indicators and methodology, how we uh, create the uh, USDM map uh, each week. Uh, I was a US Drought Monitor author just um, uh, several weeks ago, uh, early June. So I'll go over a, a real-time authoring example and then uh, conclude with a um, historical time series perspective and um, also show a, a U.S. drought monitor map uh, from the end of June. All right, so uh, yeah, how, how did the U.S. drought monitor begin? So uh, going back 25 years ago, so actually coming up on the 25th anniversary now, uh, the summer of 1999, we had a, a major drought over the eastern U.S. So that was gaining lots of attention. There were requests uh, from many people um, wanting to know like what, what the uh, drought picture, how it was changing uh, from week to week across the east. But there's also interest in a, a national U.S. drought monitor uh, product. 
So this was a uh, experimental U.S. drought monitor map from July 7th of that summer. You can see it's a pretty um, coarse resolution, uh, just highlighting areas with uh, ongoing drought. And also this was based on a single indicator, the Palmer uh, drought indi indicator index. Uh, just a few weeks later, it was revised somewhat and uh, was uh, uh, given at a, a secretarial White House briefing. And uh, it was liked so much uh, from the government officials that just the following week, it became uh, operational. So uh, as of August 18th, 1999, we had our first official U.S. drought monitor. And this may have been the fastest experimental to operational product in government history. Um, this, this moved along really fast that summer, uh, due in part to the um, you know, major drought episode across uh, the Eastern US. And initially we only had um, two dozen uh, experts that uh, contributed to the um, US drought monitor but that has really grown over the past uh, 25 years. So as, so as I mentioned previously, um, kind of the initial uh, US drought monitor map, it was based um, primarily on uh, the Palmer drought index. It's been a, um, a drought indicator that's been around um, going back uh, many decades uh, to the mid 20th century. Um, over time, though, that uh, single indicator or index has been um, supplemented with um, many more objective physical indicators and indices. And also, we incorporated more uh, subjective local expertise and impacts. So the uh, drought monitor uh, uses uh, various categories, and those are on the right-hand side there. And these are based on uh, percentiles. So you can see um, D0, abnormal dryness, is uh, between the 21st and 30th uh, percentile. And then as you move into worsening uh, drought categories, moderate to severe, you go below the 20th percentile, 10th percentile, respectively, and then down into the um, tail end of the distribution where we have extreme drought below the 5th percentile and then exceptional drought uh, down at the very, very tail end of the um, distribution. So uh, why use uh, percentiles? Um, it provides uh, a picture of expected occurrences in a given time period. Uh, all the indicators can be uh, put into these uh, percentiles to compare current data with historical records. And the uh, period of record is uh, very important. Uh, we do have some um, more new um, drought indicators that, that we do look at, um, but some of that data is only goes, goes back you know, 20 to 30 years. Um, but it's important to look at some of the um, indicators that go all the way back, you know, well into the, um, back into the early to mid uh, 20th, 20th century. So we can capture some of the major drought episodes such as the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. The 1950s was also a, a, a major um, drought period there over the Great Plains and Corn Belt. So yeah, period of records very important. So we get that um, accurate historical perspective uh, advantages of using uh, percentiles, um, they can be applied to any uh, parameter used in the drought analysis, can be applied to uh, all indicators, regardless of length of data record. So you know, even if you have a shorter period of record, you can still use this percentile um, method. But once again, um, longer period of record does help put things into um, uh, a historical perspective.
So uh, very important to uh, note that the um, U.S. Drought Monitor is an attempt to represent all of these uh, different types of droughts on one single map. And those uh, different drought droughts include uh, meteorological, which is more just you know precipitation and temperature, but then you go through agriculture drought, which uh, you know considers soil moisture, crop stress, hydrological, such as uh, reservoir levels, socioeconomic, and and even uh, ecological drought where multi-year drought can take um, its toll on the um, ecosystem. And slide nine here, this is actually one of my uh, favorite um, slides in this presentation. I think it really il illustrates well the uh, multiple types of data and timescales that go into making the uh, U.S. drought monitor each week. So not only do you have uh, precipitation, which you know, most people think of when they, they think of uh, drought, but um, you also have uh, soil moisture and groundwater, uh, stream flow, vegetative health, lake and reservoir levels, evapotranspiration, and uh, snowpack. So you have all these multiple types of data, but we're not only looking at the you know the past week or past month, but going back even on the seasonal time scale, annual, or even uh, multi-annual. You know, we've had over the Western uh, United States uh, in the past two decades um, yeah, quite a few uh, multi-year uh, type uh, drought episodes. All right, so uh, yeah, just a little. Um, background here on the U.S. Drought Monitor. So since its uh, inception in 1999, uh, the number of authors has remained uh, very steady from uh, year to year. And the authors have changed over time, but yeah, the numbers have been um, very steady, which, which is a good thing. Um, and it's varied between uh, 10 to 12 each year. And I think one of the strengths of the U.S. Drought Monitor is the authors are coming from multiple agencies. Um, you have uh, NOAA, uh, Climate Prediction Center, where I work, also the National Center for Environmental Information, the National Drought Mitigation Center, uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and the uh, Western Region uh, Climate Center. So uh, those are the author, that's where the authors come from that uh, produce the uh, weekly composite drought map. But we also uh, gather input from numerous federal and non-federal partners. And I started off the presentation that, you know, at the beginning 25 years ago, we only had uh, 24 experts weighing in on the um, drought monitor. And that's grown to uh, several hundred and now total uh, for over 400 uh, experts with their uh, knowledge base and you know expertise over uh, many years. The uh, U.S. Drought Monitor is released um, every Thursday morning. And the period um, that it's valid for is uh, the eight, eight o'clock um, the previous Tuesday to eight o'clock of that week. So it's a uh, yeah, seven day valid period. Uh, went through the uh, you know, five drought categories um, before, you know, abnormal dryness, which is not drought, that's either going into or coming out of drought. And then you have the uh, drought categories from moderate up to extreme and exceptional. And on the bottom of the slide, you can see how the um, drought map has changed over the years. You know, back uh, 1999 in the early 2000s, very uh, coarse resolution, but you can see how the uh, resolution has um, in, uh, increased, uh, improved over over the past uh, couple of decades. So the uh, drought monitor is a uh, 
consolidation of current conditions and impacts into one comprehensive uh, national drought map. So it's a you know, snapshot in time for that week um, of the uh, drought picture. Uh, the drought monitor is not a model, so it's um, you know, it's human input. A human's drawing this. We're receiving a human input from uh, various uh, experts. Um, and it's also, um, it's drawn off, the, the starting point is the uh, previous week's uh, map. It's not just interpreting precipitation. Um, as I just mentioned uh, previously, it includes uh, a number of indicators. It's uh, not a forecast. Uh, we do, though, have a drought outlook, which uh, the Climate Prediction Center issues on a monthly and seasonal time scale. And more recently, we've included a rapid onset drought hazard um, on our week two uh, hazards map. Uh, it incorporates uh, local expert input uh, by various sources, email, impact reports, and social media. It identifies impacts um, both on the uh, short-term time scale, which is less than six months, and then uh, longer-term time scale, which goes you know by, beyond the six-month uh, time scale. And there's some instances where drought can be both short-term and long-term. And it's our goal each week to be as objective as possible. We use that percentile methodology and the physical data and indicators must support the uh, map depiction. And the impacts help to uh, supplement or you know, validate the uh, physical data. So how do we determine uh, where certain areas are um, you know, drought-wise, which category? And and the, our methodology here is a, a convergence of evidence approach. Uh, we have many types of drought information, you know, each week to go through. So it's uh, it's our job as authors to determine where the majority of that data is converging. You know, is it telling the same story? Um, are most of the indicators showing D1? Um, there may be one or two that are showing like D3 or D4, but where the where's the convergence of evidence? What what's the most uh, accurate uh, depiction there in the map? And authors do need to consider you know 100% of the data, but you can't uh, determine a drought category on only one piece of data. So very important to consider uh, multiple indicators. And these data will identify different climatic and hydrologic parameters, which are needed to understand the complete picture of a drought indicator's performance and how they interact. And uh, it's important to remember, you know, impacts are the ground truth, yet aren't monitored the extent which um, other data are. So you can't measure what you uh, don't monitor. So the uh, next slide here is the uh, U.S. Drought Monitor map um, back on uh, June uh, 25th. And I'll, we went over the uh, drought categories and percentiles before, but this, this map does provide a good example of the uh, impacts. Um, <clears throat> so, for example, over most of the uh, southwestern U.S., Arizona, New Mexico, you can see that see that drought is mostly or it is um, you know long term drought where the drought over the eastern US that is short term drought you know, in in June we had a very very dry hot month and so that's led to rapid onset and intensification of uh, drought conditions over the east but that's only short term drought there's no longer term drought signal as of yet 
And then there's uh, areas of the country that are experiencing both short and long-term drought, and that includes the um, central and southern plains, also parts of the uh, Pacific Northwest. Uh, outside of the contiguous uh, United States, we also, um, the drought monitor also includes Alaska, Hawaii, and uh, Puerto Rico. And the uh, next slide here uh, gives some of the indicators that we um, look at each week at, at the top there. Um, the uh, Palmer Drought Severity Index, the uh, soil moisture modeled, uh, weekly stream flow, uh, standardized precipitation index. And these are all um, in uh, percentiles and uh, go, to go along with the uh, categories. So I'd say, would say uh, most of the uh, information analyzed each week falls into um, these uh, six categories, including uh, precipitation and snow, uh, indices such as SPI, PDSI, soil moisture, stream flow and reservoirs. There are uh, satellite remote sensing products and also the um, important expert local input and uh, impacts. So in the uh, upper left-hand corner there, those are kind of the, um, the key drought indicators um, that we uh, rely upon each week, and that's the uh, SPI, Standardized Precipitation Index, uh, modeled uh, soil moisture, uh, stream flows, uh, precipitation anomalies. Uh, as we go into the growing season during the um, spring and summer, uh, some of the uh, satellite vegetative health products become a little bit more important, a um, little bit more of a uh, factor. Um, also, uh, some of the additional uh, soil moisture products as well. And across the West, uh, snowpack is much more important than, say, the obviously like the southeastern U.S. So, yeah, the snowfall during the um, you know late fall through the winter and spring months is uh, a very important uh, drought indicator. So our, our goal each week uh, is to make the um, drought monitor is. Uh, objective as um, as we can. So we do look at these um, short and long term objective uh, drought blends. And one of the uh, values of lo looking at these uh, drought blends is to uh, designate areas of short and long term drought. So, uh, for instance, over the uh, kind of the southwestern U.S., you can see that the short-term indicators are actually showing neutral to uh, wet conditions there. Where if you look at the long-term uh, drought blends, it's showing a little bit more of a uh, long-term drought signal over California and the southwest. So, that would help determine which impact to uh, designate a specific uh, drought area. And just a kind of quick timeline of how the, the process works uh, each week. We uh, produce a, a draft map on Monday afternoon, receive uh, feedback both on Monday and Tuesday, and then a second draft uh, goes out by the end of Tuesday. And another iteration, another draft or two before the final uh, map is made by close of business on Wednesday. So yeah, very um, very heavy workload those three days of the week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday to wrap up the uh, US Drought Monitor. And then on Thursday morning each week, the uh, final map is um, released to the uh, web. So 
So uh, yeah, a very important um, part of the uh, process is that uh, local expert feedback uh, from the field. Um, and the big contribution is kind of giving us a ground truth verification. You know, what are the impacts? Um, see how the uh, physical indicators are lining up with those uh, impacts. And these uh, local experts that we hear from um, each week, there's a lot of trust both, you know, between the authors and the local experts and from the local experts up to us. And that's come about over interacting with them over years, um, you know, hearing their feedback. Uh, but also we have a, um, a U.S. Drought Monitor Forum each year. So I think that's been very helpful to, um, you know, the communication and with that, uh, that trust over time. Uh, we also, as authors, do various uh, webinars, um, also, uh, NIDIS uh, is very helpful in that, that way with uh, communication. Um, there's regional climate centers. Uh, the local experts come from uh, various uh, sources, uh, state climatologists, the USDA, uh, Native American tribal input, uh, NIDIS, and uh, various uh, drought task forces among uh, many states. So this uh, next slide gives you kind of a breakdown by state of how many uh, subscribers are on our uh, email listserv. So we have about uh, a dozen states with at least 11 participants. Um, uh, many states have at least six participants and, <clears throat> and nearly all the states have at least uh, one participant. And you can see the uh, pie chart on the right-hand side there. Um, a yeah, slight majority, 55% um, of the subscribers are uh, associated with uh, NOAA. Uh, but more than a quarter, um, universities um, and also uh, state government is our, also a pretty big um, source of the uh, subscribers. So uh, more recently, I guess going back uh, several years, but um, yeah, National Drought Mitigation Center has done a really good job of uh, having an area on the web here where the public can uh, provide their own drought impact reports and also provide kind of what the impact is, whether it's ag-related, uh, wildlife, um, water supply, and also what what they deem is um, what kind of drought level, what, what intensity they're, they're seeing. All right, so um, yeah, I did wanna provide just a, a couple of quick examples of authoring when I had the US drought monitor back at the beginning of June. Um, yeah, this first example is the uh, introduction of abnormal dryness and also expansion of that abnormal dryness D0 across uh, parts of the uh, mid-Atlantic. And we do use uh, ArcGIS to, um, you know, for drafting of these maps. So at the time, uh, if you go back to the beginning of June, we're, we're starting to see um, conditions really begin to, to dry out, uh, especially over southern New Jersey, uh, parts of uh, Delaware, uh, southern Maryland. And I did expand the D0, and that was based on 60-day uh, SPI, the Standardized Precipitation Index. Um, and I do have that labeled so you can see how we're starting to see some uh, D1, even D2 levels in the 60-day SPI. Uh, but also considered uh, uh, soil moisture. Uh, on the left-hand side, this is uh, NASA sport uh, soil moisture. So you can see that dry signal beginning to pop up there in the mid-Atlantic. 
but also uh, 28 day average stream flows are beginning to drop down in, into um, below the uh, oops, below the uh, 30th percentile here over New Jersey. So we had multiple indicators beginning to show uh, at least a D0 uh, signal. Uh, conversely, uh, we did have a one category improvement to drought conditions over parts of Texas. And that was due to a heavy rainfall over the preceding week. So what I have uh, shown here is in the shading is um, uh, seven day precipitation amount, amounts. Um, yeah, anywhere you see the, the green shading, that's more than one and a half inches of rainfall the previous week. And some areas picked up as much as two to three inches. And the outline here you see is the uh, outline of, um, of a D2 to a D1 uh, drought. So um, yeah, given the, that heavy rainfall that that part of Texas received the previous week, and also the consideration of uh, various drought indicators, a uh, one category improvement was warranted for, for that part of uh, Texas. So I wanted to uh, include a, a historical time series of the uh, U.S. Drought Monitor. This is a very helpful graphic um, uh, at the uh, National Drought Mitigation Center showing how dr drought has uh, evolved over the past 20 plus uh, years. So you can see um, you know, there's some, some years that were uh, had quite severe to extreme drought back uh, 2002, 2003, uh, 2007, 2008, um, 2011 through 12, 2012, 2013. That was a major drought that affected the uh, Great Plains and Corn Belt. And then more recently, we had three consecutive La Niñas, which uh, ramped up drought conditions over much of the country um, you know, 2021 through uh, 2023. Uh, I will point out there was a, a low point in drought um, just five years ago in the spring of 2019, where drought coverage was less than uh, 10%. So there are some times where the drought does uh, drop off um, and becomes very low. And uh, over the past six months, we did see um, drought decrease over much of the country due to um, El Nino conditions this past winter. Uh, just real quick, want to go back to uh, the summer of 2022 when we had the uh, rapid onset and intensification of drought conditions over parts of the south central u.s specifically oklahoma arkansas missouri where during a just a four-week time time uh, period from uh, early july to the beginning of august we had a um, uh, two to three class uh, degradation and drought conditions in that four-week time span so you can see um, if you go back to July 5th, uh, some areas of Oklahoma and Arkansas actually were, were free of any type of uh, dryness at all. So not even a D0. Go forward uh, four weeks by the beginning of August, those areas had worsened into D2 and D3. So just in a four week time span, you can see that a rapid um, onset intensification of drought and the reason I wanted to show this is kind of give you an example of um, how much the uh, drought monitor has improved over the past um, several years, but especially the past decade in capturing these uh, flash drought episodes. Now on the, I guess the uh, good news part, um, as far as drought goes, um, this past winter, we did have major improvements over the uh, southern tier of the uh, United States. Um, this was very well forecast. Um, 
very typical of El Nino. You have uh, wetter conditions over southern, the southern tier of the country. So going into um, this past winter, we had uh, severe to extreme drought over the uh, lower Mississippi Valley, southeastern United States. And during that uh, 12-week uh, period through the winter, uh, many areas had um, at least a, a two-class improvement, some areas as much as a three to four-class improvement. So uh, if you go from uh, early December to early March, you can see how the, the drought really uh, improved over the uh, southern tier of the country. Most areas became uh, drought-free by the uh, beginning of March. And there was even some improvement over the uh, central to southern plains and southwestern U.S. So, yeah, good example of here of how uh, El Nino improved uh, drought conditions across uh, the United States. And this is uh, the uh, drought Picture as of June 25th, talked about this uh, earlier, the um, short-term drought developing over the uh, Eastern US during June, we've had a one to two class uh, degradation in uh, drought conditions. Um, so going into uh, July, this was um, really the major uh, drought concern was over parts of, of the uh, Eastern US, but still have a um, short to long-term drought as well over parts of the Great Plains and uh, Western U.S. This concludes my uh, presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I will now pass it off to the uh, next presenter, Compton Tucker. Thank you, Brad. Um, I'm Compton Tucker from the Goddard Space Flight Center and I'll be showing some examples of food security and drought mapping from satellites. So let's get into it. This is a graphic example of drought where you see it's been so dry that a reservoir has dried up. And if you were to try and use a boat, this is your situation. You would be unable to do so. Now, there is a, a great source of information on wo world agricultural crop production, which is provided monthly by the U.S. Department of, Agric of Culture's Foreign Agricultural Service. This is one issue from March. It comes out every month, usually around the, the 10th of the month or before. And this has examples of the current situation with many crops globally. And this information in this report is also used to set the commodity prices at the Chicago Board of Trade. This is one example. The first slide focuses on the variability and trend in Brazil soybean yield. And you see that it runs through 2024, starting in 2014. And you see the upward trend because of increasing agricultural productivity with respect to time. And so this is one example from the March 2024 World Agricultural Production document. These documents are usually 30, 40, 50 pages. Uh, now, in these World Agricultural Production uh, monthly reports, they have a lot of examples that are based on NASA satellite data. This is an example of what I'll be talking about. Now, if you look in the upper right-hand corner uh, of the body of the graph, you see an insert entitled Zambia. So the highlighted blue area is the, the agricultural reporting district from which this NDVI image with respect to time comes from. Now, there's a lot of information that's very useful in this image that the upper gray zone is the maximum NDVI data from 2001 to 2021. And the lower value is the minimum NDVI value 
from 20 uh, from 2001 to 2021 so that 22 year period and then the dark black line is the median and the red line is the plot for the current year of the crop year 2023 and 2024 because we are in the southern hemisphere and you'll see these data come from early july they're very current we produce data for the Foreign Agricultural Service um, at eight day intervals, and these are incorporated into these reports from the Foreign Agricultural Service. So you see that the red plot falls in the bottom part of the historical record, and this is indicative of an agricultural drought. And so the Foreign Agricultural Service will, will update figures like this as they get closer to the end of the growing season, which will occur in August or September. Now, in our work, we use the normalized difference vegetation index, but we also use solar induced fluorescence. And solar induced fluorescence is a byproduct of the photosynthetic process where uh, energy used in photosynthesis escapes from the photosynthetic system in the form of, of emitted energy. And this is a very useful tool because this is directly linked to photosynthesis. Now, this is a flux, meaning it is emitted energy, and so you measure it as a flux. But one of the features of solar-induced fluorescence is you have to measure it within Fraunhofer lines, which are areas in the electromagnetic spectrum of the downwelling solar flux from the sun, where in the photosphere of the sun, certain wavelength regions are absorbed by elements in the photosphere. And these uh, absorption areas are usually one or two or three angstroms wide, so they're very narrow. So in order to measure solar-induced fluorescence, you have to make measurements in these very, very small wavelength regions of the downwelling solar flux. And this means it's very difficult to get down to the very fine spatial resolutions with solar-induced fluorescence because it requires a long integration time. Now, from a polar orbiting satellite where you're moving at seven kilometers per second, the only solution is to measure areas which can be quite large on the order right now of perhaps thousands of meters. However, a instrument in a geostationary orbit would be able to get down probably to measurements on the order of a few hundred meters. And so, again, solar-induced fluorescence is a flux, and I will now compare solar-induced fluorescence to what we can measure from numerous satellites in terms of vegetation indices. This is a comparison which I have made between solar-induced fluorescence from the GOM-2 satellite data of Joanna Joyner and, and, and Yasko Yoshida of NASA Goddard, and I've compared them to MODIS NDVI data like we use in our product or in our system, which we uh, run for the Foreign Agricultural Service. And I've simply taken the time integral of these two measurements, and you see there's a very high correlation in a linear way. So what this shows is you're comparing a potential in terms of a vegetation index to a flux from solar-induced fluorescence, and they are very highly and linearly correlated. So this means that when you're using vegetation indices, what you are estimating is a, is a potential which is directly and linearly related to solar-induced fluorescence. And the value of doing this, uh, or one of the consequences of doing this with vegetation indices, is you can get down to finer and finer spatial resolutions on the order of four or five meters from planet data, or 10 meters by 10 meters from Sentinel-2, 
or 30 meters from Landsat. And here I'm using 250 meter data from both MODIS instruments. This is a plot of showing for 31 sites how we have compared the integrated GOM2 solar induced fluorescence, a flux from, from photosynthesizing plants. Uh, and, and we then compare this to the time integral of MODIS in DVI data. And you'll see, uh, once again, we, we have this high linear correlation between them. And this is why we can use the vegetation indices uh, because we now know they are directly related to primary production. And primary production is what happens in agricultural fields. It's what determines yield. And we can also detect when vegetation indices are affected by drought conditions, gross primary production will be reduced. Now, here is an interesting figure from April of 2024 in the area of Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia in the Maghreb region of Northwest Africa. And in the red areas are where you have a very severe drought. In the yellow areas, you have potential drought, and only in the green areas do you not have a drought. So this is formed from NDVI data from MODIS, and the MODIS instruments are phenomenal, and uh, unfortunately, they're both uh, about to be decommissioned and replaced by data from the VIRS satellites, which are also very, very good for measuring photosynthetic conditions. Now let's look in particular at one area in Algeria and one area in Morocco. We'll look at Morocco first, which is indicated in the top of these two figures. You see the blue area. So the blue area shows this crop growing area in Morocco and the southern and central growing area. And you see again the NDVI profile of the maximum value and the minimum value in the gray zone. And then within that, you see the median value. And you also see in the red area, the 2023, 2024 area. And so this is a good example of a drought because all the values are on the lower part of the scale. And the lower figure is from Algeria and you see something similar. So this shows in detail what was observed in the previous figure with respect to crop growing regions by crop growing regions. Now, one of the things the Foreign Agricultural Service does is they have field visits where they go out, they're called crop tours. And they go out and so here they were in April, um, on April 17th and 18th in, in Morocco. And you see the conditions are not good because of drought. So this is confirmation of what we've been measuring with satellites. Now here is another example from Zambia. And unfortunately, there is a drought in Southern Africa. And if you look on the on the left hand side, you see the areas of Zambia in red, which are affected by drought. The percent of average seasonal greenness or photosynthetic capacity from the MODIS instruments. And on the right hand side, you see the same very useful plot. Of the envelope of the maximum and the minimum MODIS values for a 22 year record with the average and then in red, it shows data from 2024, and you see it's on the very low side. So this is unequivocal evidence of agricultural drought and a very severe drought. This is a summary slide from Zambia for corn, and you, here we're summing data from, from 2010 and 2011. On, on the right-hand side figure, 
for the area which you see in green, all the crop growing areas uh, for Zambia. And then it goes to 2024. Uh, and you see that the yield this year will be very, very low, and it will be um, equal to the lowest yield historically. So it's data like these, which we use to look at agricultural droughts in a very specific crop growing area by crop growing area. And because we have the value, and because we have the MODIS data, which are very well calibrated, very, very accurate. It's a phenomenal system using two satellites, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. We're able to get excellent photosynthetic capacity data, and I've showed several examples of that. And so they can be used to look at the envelope of photosynth photosynthetic uh, maximum or minimum for any time period for any area. And that is directly related to yield and is an unequivocal way to look at agricultural droughts. So thank you for your attention. This is a good example of applied remote sensing to train, empower, and advance our knowledge, and specifically for food security from satellites. I'm now going to pass the baton to Sean McCartney, who will be doing a demonstration with Google Earth Engine as it relates to what I have presented. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. The following case study will demonstrate how to calculate the Standardized Precipitation Index, or SPI, which is a deviation from the mean in units of the standard deviation calculated from precipitation values. The script was written in JavaScript for Google Earth Engine and adapted from the United Nations training, drought monitoring using the standardized precipitation index. The demonstration will show how to calculate monthly SPI based on daily CHIRPS precipitation data from 1981, which will be summed to monthly precipitation data for our analysis. The demonstration will also show how to calculate the Vegetation Condition Index, or VCI, which compares the current NDVI to the range of values observed in the same period in previous years. The Vegetation Condition Index, or VCI, is expressed in percent and gives an idea where the observed NDVI value is situated between the minimum and maximum NDVI values in previous years. At the top of the script, you can see I've already imported the CHIRPS precipitation data and boundaries layer to use in the script. To learn more about each of these data sets, you can click on the data set highlighted in blue. For our area of interest, or AOI, we'll need to define that ourselves. To start off, we'll use the polygon tool in the top left corner of the map pane to draw a bounding box around an area of interest. In this case, our area of interest is the country of Zimbabwe in southern Africa. Specifically, we're interested in the Midlands province within the country, which is the biggest maize-producing province in the country. To create that bounding box, we'll use the uh, bounding box polygon. And once we've created that, we'll go to the gear icon and we'll change some of the name and parameters. First, we'll rename the layer AOI. And then under import as, it's very important that we change this to feature collection. Both of these parameters need to be changed in order for the script to run. I've already created that bounding box, so I will not be duplicating those efforts. Alternatively, you can also upload a shapefile for your area of interest as an asset in Google Earth Engine and then import it into the script. I will now walk you through the different lines of the script so you can understand exactly what's happening. <clears throat> lines 48 to 65 set the base map to satellite view filter the global administrative units layer to the country of Zimbabwe and Midlands province respectively, centers the map window on the area of interest, and adds the layers to the map pane after running the code. The next step is to set the time frame for our analysis. In line 73, we create a variable named first image to obtain the first chirps daily data from the time series. 
Since the data are, in, are indexed, we use zero to obtain the first image in the chirps time series. Line 74 defines a new variable, latest image, and assigns an earth image date of April 1st, 2024. This is at the end of the rainy season in Southern Africa. Since chirps data have a spatial resolution of 0 0.05 degrees, which corresponds to approximately 5,550 meters at the equator, we define a variable resolution and assign the value 5,550 meters as the spatial resolution of our chirps data. The next section of code sets the time scale of our hour analysis for SPI. Meteorologists usually recognize one month as the shortest time scale for the calculation of SPI. Shorter time scales might underlie random fluctuations in precipitation. SPI can also be calculated for longer scales, like two months, three months, six months, etc. The script allows the possibility to set your own time frame for the calculation of SPI. It is important to note that for this code, SPI calculations work only for the following quantity of months. In line 99, we define a variable named time step where we select two as the number of months for calculating SPI. Lines 114 to 120 defines a variable named threshold months and sets the threshold at 12 coinciding with one year, creates a list with a lag of one month between each list entry starting from the latest image counting backwards, and creates a simple list indexed from zero sequentially to the variable defined above. The next block of code from lines 123 to 129 defines a variable time list date to map the dates beginning with the latest image using the month's ends over the list counting backward in time. It then prints the dates from the list to the console tab. Line 132 defines a variable sorted time list to sort the list above according to their dates. Lines 135 to 157 define a variable precipitation sum to map a function calculating the monthly sum of chirps. Just those images will be kept whose time frame corresponds to the user provided number of months. In this demonstration, we are using two months for our calculation of SPI. Line 161 defines a variable named summed chirps collection and copies the properties of the chirps collection to the monthly collection. Lines 173 to 220 determine the approach to calculate SPI based on the number of months. If the number of months is less than 12, the day of year information has to be used to find the correct images. If SPI is calculated for 12 or more months, the day of year information is not necessary. Depending on the approach, less than 12 months or greater than 12 months, an SPI calculation is performed to subtract the mean precipitation from the selected month with the result divided by the standard deviation. Lines 225 to 232, use a print statement for the time period of the analysis, define a variable SPI monthly viz to use as visualization parameters, and finally add the SPI results as a layer to the map window. Since we selected April 1st, 2024 as the last image for the analysis and used two months as the time step for SPI calculation, the name of the layer in the map window will be shown as SPI2 from February, 2024. Lines 237 to 258 define variables to plot monthly precipitation across the time series of chirps data within the AOI, or area of interest, then print those charts to the console tab. Lines 263 to 278 
define variables to plot two-month SPI values within our AOI from the beginning of the CHIRPS time series through April 1st, 2024. And lines 284 to 331 create an inspector chart for SPI values. The chart with SPI values only appears when using the inspector tab and clicking in a given pixel with the map window. The rest of the code is written to generate titles, legends, and export the results as GeoTIFF file to your Google Drive. Now that we have calculated precipitation anomalies, the next section of code will demonstrate how to calculate the Vegetation Condition Index, or VCI, which compares the current NDVI to the range of values observed uh, in the same period in previous years. The VCI is expressed in percent and gives an idea where the observed value is situated between the extreme values, minimum and maximum, in previous years. The script was adapted from the UN Spider Knowledge Portal, Agriculture Drought Monitoring and Hazard Assessment using Google Earth Engine. Within this script, MODIS data is used to calculate the vegetation condi condition index. It is a better indicator of water stress condition than NDVI. The deviation of the vegetation condition is an indicator of the intensity of the impact of drought on vegetation growth. In line 502, we first define a variable to filter the FAO gall feature collection to the country Zimbabwe. This will be our area of interest for calculating the Vegetation Condition Index, or VCI. Alternatively, we can import a shapefile of our study area or define the area of interest using the Polygon tool. Lines 523 and 524 define variables for the month and year to calculate VCI. You will have to change these parameters for your own analysis. Lines 533 to 555 transform the dates of the MODIS data by aggregating them to a monthly time step, define visualization parameters, and define the time period in which the VCI is calculated. Lines 558 to 566 define a variable for the image collection, which is the Terra Modis 16-day vegetation indices at 250 meter spatial resolution. Filter by the date range, define a function for applying a scaling factor, and map that function over the image collection. Lines 569 and 570 define variables for the minimum and maximum NDVI values in the image collection. Lines 573 to 577 define variables for the specific month to calculate the VCI. Lines 580 to 589 calculate VCI and clip the results to the area of interest. Lines 599 to 605 bin the VCI result into categorical classifications representing extreme, severe, moderate, mild, and no drought, respectively. Lower values indicate bad vegetation state conditions, while the inverse is true for higher values. VCI varies from 0 for extremely unfavorable conditions to 100 for optimal vegetation conditions. To export the results of the drought index as a feature class, you'll need to uncomment lines 609 to 617. Lines 622 to 625 add the layer to the map pane while assigning visualization parameters and a title. The rest of the script creates and formats the legend for the drought index. We can now see under the console tab after running the script, the results from running the code and the layers added to the map pane. We can see we've created charts for the two-month precipitation time series, and this is from 1980 to 2024. We've also created charts for the two-month SPI, 
starting from the beginning of the time series in 1980 and going to 2024. And these charts are created specifically for our area of interest, which we defined using the polygon tool. All the code has been commented so you can follow along on your own with specifications on which parameters will need to be changed to run the code in your area of interest. To recap, this demonstration showed how to use Google Earth Engine to calculate the standardized precipitation index and vegetation condition index to characterize drought in Zimbabwe during the rainy season in 2024. This code is available for you to modify for your own area of interest. Every effort was made to ensure this map is free of errors, but there is no warrant the map or its features are either spatially or temporally accurate. This map is provided without any warranty or any kind whatsoever, either express or implied. With that, I'll turn the presentation back to Amita to provide a summary of today's training. Amita, over to you. Thank you so much, Sean, for the demonstration of calculating SPI and NDVI in GEE. And that brings us to the end of today's session. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, today we identified remote sensing observations and regional and global web tools for drought monitoring, uh, described indicators and methodology for determining drought categories based on percentile values of SPI, PDSI, soil moisture, and stream flow, uh, discussed the use of NTVI and SIF in drought mapping for food security, we reviewed features of drought.gov and US drought monitor portals to monitor drought conditions and identified methodology to calculate SPI and NTVI from remotely sensed data in Google Earth Engine. Part two will be on 25th of July. We will focus on overview of NASA subseasonal to seasonal forecast system and then also learn how to access and analyze S2S data specifically precipitation temperature forecast uh, to assess evolving drought conditions in next two to three months. About homework and certificates, there will be one final homework that will be posted on 1st August, that's the last day of this training, and it will be available from the training web page. Uh, answers must be submitted via Google Forms and the homework will be due by 15th of August. Also note that there will be two exercises in GEE. One is posted today and there will be another one on 30th of July. Um, so please go through these hands-on exercises in GEE, the codes provided to you. Um, so you will be saving some of the images from your exercise and answering questions uh, in the homework assignment. Those who attend all three live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline will receive a certificate of completion via email uh, approximately two months after the training is over. Uh, thank you for attending today's session, everyone. We want to uh, sincerely thank all our speakers today, um, including uh, Kelsey Satolino, Steve Ansari, Brad Pugh, uh, Compton Tucker, and Sean McCartney for wonderful presentations and uh, rich information about a number of drought tools and then how to calculate drought indices. Um, so uh, you today's session is a little longer, but uh, next session will be um, shorter than this. Um, you have GEE exercise for you to work on this week. Um, every week you will have some exercises to do. Um, the one that is um, provided today and one will be in session three uh, will be in GEE. Others are um, optional. So um, we have a number of uh, questions here. Um, and before we go to the question answer session, I also want to thank um, our training coordinators, uh, Natasha Johnson Griffin and Sarah Karshel. Uh, also, we have Brock Levins and uh, Salvin Hudson Odoi and uh, Sue Monti uh, for their help and coordination of this training. Um, we have several questions um, and um, I can um, 
first of all, since uh, Dr. Pu is here, uh, maybe we should um, address questions that um, he has answered, and then we can go back to other questions. In any case, we will be posting all the answers on our uh, web page uh, later on. So, uh, Brad, if you want to go through the questions, that would be great. Uh, I think question 29, um, have you, have there been any attempts to generate all different types of trout globally? Yeah, hello. Um, yeah, there have been attempts. Um, I know we, we have the uh, North American uh, Drought Monitor, which is a, I mean, that's only for North America, but it's a collaboration between Canada, the United States, and Mexico for drought monitoring. And that's updated each month. Thank you. Um, and there was a table uh, provided. Um, there are a number of global tools. They um, they look at different parameters and uh, monitor drought. So you can refer to that table in the presentation. Um, then question 30, uh, what do you mean by socioeconomic drought? Isn't all drought linked to socioeconomics in terms of different impact? What does this drought mean? Yeah, so uh, associate O economic drought um, that occurs when like a demand for a good uh, exceeds uh, supply due to uh, a lack of precipitation, low water supply. Um, it's I mean somewhat different from like hydrological drought, which you know that's more low reservoir. So there's you know, different types of drought, meteorological, agricultural, hydro hydrological, and then socioeconomic. Question 31, uh, in the fire service, we often use KBDI. Um, so which takes into account daily temperature, vegetation cover, and rainfall. Are any of these indicators especially good for monitoring fire conditions? Yeah, so um, I know, yeah, the KBDI, um, as the uh, the question there um, states, like that's used quite extensively in uh, fire weather, um, but we do also use it in drought monitoring. Um, yeah, I just gave this example that, yeah, it's uh, considered uh, quite a bit um, during the spring across the uh, Florida Peninsula. That's kind of their uh, fire weather season, but also you can have uh, <clears throat> droughts that um, develop across uh, Florida in the late winter and spring. Thank you. So next question, um, is the percentile relative to that place? So the actual conditions may be different across the country, but the relative severity is scaled to each place. Yeah, we had a, a few questions on the percentiles. So um, yeah, they're valid or percentiles of indicators are valid for specific locations. And that puts that indicator into historical context. I, I guess for an example, say we have 100 years of precipitation records and you want one, your value over that is like in the 20th percentile that's in, within that 100 period of record. Um, yeah, we had a few questions on that, but um, yeah, percentiles are used for precipitation, applied to precipitation, soil moisture, stream flow. Um, and, you know, yeah, they do vary over geographic uh, regions. Thank you. Uh, then there's a question about, is AI used as part of the U.S. Trout Monitor? Yeah, currently authors uh, yeah, do not use uh, 
uh, AI. I know there's been some like research papers, um, I believe out of NASA actually, um, they've tried to like replicate the drought monitor using machine learning. So um, that, that has gained attention over the past, um, past several years. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, one more question is, what do you mean by real-time authoring? Yeah, I just um, yeah wanted to provide an example um, of when I authored back in uh, early June, just to give everybody, um, all the attendees there, just a um, kind of a peek behind the curtain of how, how the uh, drought monitor is um, you know, made each each day of the the authoring uh, period. Thank you. So uh, there are a number of questions, and Brad, if you want to address any of them, uh, please feel free. Um, I'm going to go back um, and start from the top. And um, uh, we'll see how many we can address right now, but we will post all the answers on our web training web page uh, later on. So we'll start with question one. Uh, could you suggest satellite data for small scale studies like 30 meter precipitation, groundwater, and soil moisture? So unfortunately, uh, the open source data that we have, satellite data, they don't have uh, such high resolutions. Um, but there are uh, modeling systems like on mesoscale or regional models such as uh, WRF for weather research and forecasting. And there's also watershed level models such as soil and water assessment tool or SWOT. Uh, some of these models uh, use observed data which are not that high resolution, but then the, they model uh, at higher resolution and you get some of the information at high resolution. So that is possible. Later on, you will see a reference to a uh, spot list that also can be used at uh, high resolution, not 30 meter, but relatively high resolution. And anyone, Sean, Brad, please um, do add if I'm missing something. Uh, question two is a deficit in soil moisture related to agricultural or, or hydrological drought. So soil moisture affects both agricultural and hydrological uh, droughts. So variability in precipitation will result in surface and root zone soil moisture, and that does impact vegetation and agricultural drought. But prolonged drought periods would deplete uh, column soil water. So su subsurface soil water moisture is also affected, and so then that result that can result in hydrological drought. Question three, uh, Sean, you may want to address this. Can you explain why the SPI goes by three, six, nine, and 12 months and not every two or five months? Is it about a cycle? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, thanks to whoever asked that. Uh, yeah, so the SPI code that was provided today in Earth Engine in JavaScript can be calculated from one month, two months, up to 12 months, and then also 24 and 48. So you are limited in that, but there's no reason why you couldn't calculate a two month or a five month SPI. Um, it's quite common actually to do that, and it's more in it's more appropriate based on how long the rainy season is, or how long you feel that there, uh, you know, drought conditions were persisting for. So if you're trying to look at that, you know, long term mean compared to you know the uh, specific season, then you would certainly want to uh, find an appropriate month in which to do so. So we I think we listed maybe three, six, nine, and twelve uh, just because they're in increments of three, but you could certainly do this on on two to five. And I think the most important thing is just really focusing in on when that rainy season is. Uh, some some countries, some regions of the planet, geographies have more than one rainy season, so you might be looking at more than one. But I think the important thing is really trying to, you know, do that analysis using SPI on those specific rainy season or seasons. And I think it's also good to note too that SPI is more appropriate in regions that are rain fed and not irrigated. So, you know, California, where I'm from, uh, it's primarily, uh, you know, irrigated agriculture. So SPI would not be as important, uh, say, in, in those uh, climates that it would be in, in more rain fed uh, geographies. And I'll go ahead and take question number four as well. Uh, can SPI keep be calculated for short, short term periods, weekly and monthly? And uh, really, meteorologists usually recognize one month 
as the shortest time scale for calculating uh, SPI. And that's because there's going to be a lot of noise. There's going to be a lot of uh, underlying random fluctuations of precipitation if you're looking at less than one month. So one month is typically the, the threshold or the, the cutoff in which SPI is typically calculated and anything over one month as well. So uh, Amita, I'll toss it back to you. Thanks. Thanks, Sean. Uh, question five is, what is the correlation between soil land degradation and drought? Um, so uh, several research studies can be found. There are regional studies of how um, droughts affect uh, soil and land degradation. Um, there is a uh, reference that we found, um, uh, and the link is provided here, and there are references in this report uh, that can provide information about this topic. Certainly, there is a relationship between uh, drought and land degradation, and it is more regional. Um, and um, Brad, if you have anything um, to add to that, uh, so please do. So the next question is, what is the age of the drought.gov archive data? And we'll have to uh we'll find out and and get back to you on that one so next one is tarp.gov only available for the us or also asia pacific uh dot org is uh, right now available over the us but um if you go to nida's uh, website you will see that is also an international drought monitoring component that is uh noah's gdis Tool that also provides global information. Next question, uh, Sean, you may want to answer. I want to work on soil moisture based drought prediction for a 450 kilometer square watershed. Uh, how, how can I get high resolution soil moisture data? Yeah, it's a good question. A lot of the, or pretty much all of the uh, NASA NOAA products are going to be at coarser spatial resolution, <clears throat> but there is uh, a product specifically for the contiguous United States. So that's the lower 48 states. And it's actually a, a NASA product uh, put out by the NASA sport team. And that's a three kilometer uh, spatial resolution. It is a modeled soil moisture product. Um, but uh, but that being said, it is at uh, you know three kilometer spatial resolution, which could you know definitely work within that you know 450 kilometer square kilometer watershed. Uh, if you're looking for higher resolution data sets outside of the contiguous United States, uh, I would recommend you look uh, back to question the answer to question number one, which was uh, posed earlier. And I mean, I'll go ahead and take question num number nine as well. Yes. What method is good for predicting meteorological drought? And as shown in multiple times, both in Climate Engine as well as in Earth Engine, the Standardized Precipitation Index, or SPI, uh, is a precipitation-only uh, you know, uh, derived index and is well-suited for characterizing meteorological drought on a range of timescales. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. Uh, question 10, um, it will, uh, I will address that um, and we'll talk to Dr. Tucker and then uh, answer that question. Is historical drought data available in other countries as well? This is question 11. So yes, past observations of precipitation, surface temperature, soil moisture, groundwater, and vegetation index, they're all available globally and historically. Um, most data are available, data sets available for 20 plus years, uh, many between 10 to 20 years of data. So globally available. So question 12, um, again, I think uh, it's GEE, Sean, you may want to address that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think this is uh, for both Climate Engine and in Google Earth Engine, they were interested, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, can we, uh, to, to use this data, is it possible to, to use a cloud environment? That is a question. And then the answer is, you know, we, we showed demonstrations both using Climate Engine uh, which uses Google Earth Engine in the background, as well as is the code provided JavaScript code in Earth Engine to calculate both the standardized precipitation index and the vegetation con condition index. Both of those are cloud platforms, and uh, they're both used for environmental monitoring on a global scale. So all the data sets, all the demonstrations uh, can be applied in any geography, basically. And uh, in both Climate Engine and in Earth Engine, 
who showed how to export uh, either by uncommenting code or just using the graphical user interface to export as geotiffs for your uh, for the results that you were able to achieve for your area of interest. So uh, thanks so much, Mita, back to you. Thank you. Uh, question 13, it's more of a broad overview question, but how would you fuse the data? And so data fusion is, um, it's not a you know, trivial topic, but um, uh, we will provide you references where some data have been fused together, such as Lentset and Sentinel-2, uh, iMERGE, which uh, combines a lot of um, data for deriving precipitation. So we'll provide you um, information about that and references. So for different spectral bands, different satellites, different techniques are used, um, but you have to have uh, some coincident data from multiple satellites to derive relationship between you know, what different sensors are looking at and then derive a uh, technique to fuse the data. And so this is also a broad answer to a broad overview question. Question 14, can the drought data be extrapolated for floods from the JPEG picture shown? I'm not exactly sure which JPEG uh, pictures we're talking about, uh, but something like SPI uh, can be used to detect both dry and wet periods. So they can be used to look at flood conditions. Question 15, how is NASA data useful for drought prone area assessments in India? Is it possible to know the major causes of drought from a historical time frame from satellite data? If yes, then which satellite images can be used and how? Um, I think um, the second part of the question, um, uh, you, you would be looking at historical data such as precipitation, land surface temperature, um, evapotranspiration, and uh, soil moisture, all these data sets are available from um, GPM, um, SMAP, um, Landsat. Uh, so you, you can use these uh, long term data sets. Not sure about how useful for. Um, okay, sorry. Um, how is NASA data useful for drought prone area assessment in India? So I think. These are global data and um, you can analyze them over India where in the drought prone region. Again, looking at um, long-term climatology of these parameters and then looking at anomalies. That's the first step to look at um, droughts. Okay, uh, there are several questions about climate engine. Um, that uh, we will answer um, and post them on the website. The question, then question 19, the time series on climate engine can only produce charts and not map, is that right? So, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead and answer this. Uh, uh, that is correct. Yeah, if you're running uh, the uh, a time series as an output in 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 Climate Engine, then yeah, you, the graph will be the uh, only result, um, and that's under the Make a Graph tab. But if you do want to focus on maps, uh, you won't be able to get that time series as a as a, uh, but you will be able to get results using that uh, Make Map tab at the top left of the application. So thanks. Question twenty is: Can you extract data sets region by region? Um, so yes, all satellite data that we talked about here, the, you can extract uh, for different regions, uh, either by using some polygons or shape files, you can extract them for different regions. There's one more question about uh, climate engine. So we'll have to get back to you on that one. Uh, question 22 as well about ocean chlorophyll in climate engine. Uh, question 23, are there free learning resources for further understanding of climate engine? If so, please share. I really think it's a great resource. And uh, the link is provided here.
So for all the climate engine uh, related questions, we will be posting them on the website. Moving down to question 27, is this the correct URL for the previous presentation and the app for climate engine? We receive a not secure message when accessing. Is this app free or do we need to pay for the subscription? Hmm. Okay, so I think it it's um, you you may want to try it later on because right now uh, we are also getting the same message. Uh, question twenty eight: Are there any data sets available for agricultural drought monitoring at the field scale? So um, there is a uh, site Open ET. Uh, there are multiple models calculating evapotranspiration based on remote sensing and other data. Um, they provide field level evapotranspiration and NDVI data that you may want to look at. So Open ET, um, I believe, is focused mostly on the US, but there is also um, Landsat based evapotranspiration calculator EE Flux that provides Landsat based 30 meter resolution ET and NDVI that you can um, look at to see agricultural drought. Also, NASA's sport, soil moisture and vegetative health index are high resolution products. So, uh, and we did cover question 29 to all the way about uh, 37. And going to question 38, can Sentinel uh, Copernicus data be used in any way to produce um, trout indices? So both Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, uh, they can be used for land cover mapping. Um, Sentinel-2 has uh, red and infrared bands, MSI is the sensor, so that can be used to calculate NDVI, yes. And there's one more question about is the percentile relative to the place we covered that question 40 can we link to the world agricultural production data web page can can it be shared um, we'll look into that question 41 is this global data set suitable for monitoring seasonal Trout over a crop growth period, specifically in a rainfed agriculture region, which is the most efficient in the, which is the most efficient index to monitor such trout. So I think Sean, you have replied to this question. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the uh, all of these uh, the data sets that we showed today: precipitation, soil moisture, uh, how to calculate vegetation indices. Uh, for multispectral uh, imagery, et cetera. Uh, they're all uh, very well suited for seasonal drought, especially specifically over specific time periods. So if you're looking at, you know, like a four month uh, rain fed uh, agricultural uh, geography, you could certainly use, you know, SPI and, and some of the vegetation indices for that. And then uh, you can characterize that with both SPI and VCI, uh, as well as in, in climate engine, which was uh, thoroughly demonstrated today as well. So all these are, are very well suited for, you know, uh, specific gro crop growth periods, as well as rain fed agriculture. Thanks. Um, yes, thank you, Sean. Uh, question 42 is for Dr. Tucker, and so we will uh, get back to you on that one after talking to him. Um, question 43 again, how to, do I download the raster image for SPI and VCI? Uh, yeah, so in the script, uh, as well as in the exercise, the link that we provided to you on the web, on the training page, you can access the step-by-step uh, -step exercise on how to uh, comment and change different parameters, as well as uncomment different sections of the script to export the results as GeoTIFF files to your Google Drive. So if you click on that link, or also if you go to the training webpage, you can access that part one exercise, and you'll be able to follow along and then be able to export those results as well. Thanks. Great. Uh, the next question is also about uh, atmospheric correction in GEE. 
Yes, all the data sets uh, shown today demonstrated in GE have already been atmospherically and radiometrically corrected, so you can use them analysis ready. Yeah, thanks. Great. The next question is, can, can you give some reference script in GEE to make a historical NDVI graph showing mean max area and historical mean with MODIS? I believe um, you can find MODIS NDVI calculation uh, script online, um, and we'll, we'll try and share that with you. Historical NDVI graph showing mean max area. So I think you 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 will have uh, you you will share a script with you which calculates uh, NDVI historical NDVI from MODIS, and based on that, I think uh, you can find statistics. Can we calculate VCI using Landsat eight using the same code? This question forty six. So, Sean, can that be done? Yeah, I think it'll be a little tricky. I'd have to, to take a look at the code because it was set up for, for MODIS. So uh, we will get back to you and we'll answer that uh, when we post this online. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So uh, we will uh, talk about uh, SIF and NDVI question 47. We'll get back to you on that question after talking to Dr. Tucker. Question 48 Is there R package through which these drought indices can be calculated? Personally, I am not aware of uh, R package which calculate drought indices. Question 49, how deep are drought conditions suggested to trend um, in inches feet below surface levels? And do drought trends affect aquifers? Um, so second part of the question, that's, that's true, they do affect uh, aquifer. Um, uh, now, how deep, I think it would depend on the intensity of the drought. Uh, and so uh, I think, has has to be studied by drought events and there is no one single answer that um, how many inches of feet uh, below soil surface it would be affected but it is true that um, groundwater and aquifers they are affected by drought conditions Question 50, are there any drought models that show optimistic and pessimistic predictions regarding future drought conditions? Um, so we will be looking at model output to see evolving droughts. So next week we'll look at seasonal uh, drought predictions. Uh, and after that, we'll look at climate change prediction of drought. So basically temperature and precipitation. And so there are models, and um, they do provide guideline of how things are going to go. Um, they, these models are validated with past data, as you will see next week. Uh, so I think at, based on that, you can make judgment for your own region, which model you can use uh, for drought prediction. Question 51, are there any plans to add more data sets in climate engine related to the cryosphere or glacier monitoring? Are there any climate engine type visualization portals? If you have any sources, can you please share any related to materials or data sets? Um, so not sure about climate engine part, uh, we'll find out, but we will share um, sources for um, cryosphere and glacier data, uh, we'll, we'll post that in the question and answer uh, document. So with that, I think we want to thank you all so very much for um, attending this session. Um, and 
questions which we have not addressed, we will address them and post them. Uh, we'll see you on Thursday, on 25th of July. Uh, we will be talking about um, sub-seasonal to seasonal drug prediction at that point. And um, again, thank you all so very much on uh, behalf of all of us. And I want to thank all our uh, guest speakers, especially Dr. Pew for being here for this webinar and answering all the questions as well. So thanks everyone and see you on 25th.